when I first learned how to package my brand assets before I actually knew about Adobe Express. Export, export, export. It was so manual that it sometimes took me a whole day. But now, create a library, pop all the assets in, and then I go to Adobe. That better? Oh, you mean I gotta pick it up? All right. Have to hold. So what happens when people need to click? That's fine. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second segment of the 2023 George W. Crockett Community Law School. This law school is indeed a law school because we talk about the law and we school you on a lot of different things. It's part of the Thurgood Marshall, Ruth Bader Ginsburg legal initiative of the Detroit branch of NAACP. Hopefully we still remember who Thurgood Marshall was, first black Supreme Court justice, took them 95 years to get one, but when they got one, they got a good one. Thurgood Marshall served on the court starting August 30th, 1967 until 1991. And I think one of the most critical statements he made was in the 1987 speech he gave during the bicentennial of the Constitution of the United States in which he said, the government they, meaning the founding fathers, devised was defective from the start. So that meant that he was very active in social, political, and racial issues. And our initiative is also named after Ruth Bader Ginsburg, 
who was the first Jewish woman to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. And she was most well known for her support of voting rights and affirmative action. But the law school is named after George W. Crockett Jr. And I think it's significant just to point out a couple of things about Judge, Attorney, Congressman Crockett. 68 years he dedicated himself to serving unpopular causes. He was a stalwart in that sense. And I, I just want to point out that he did something extremely innovative when the when New Bethel, Bethel Baptist Church was raided, raided by police officers, police officers and, and, and hundreds, hundreds of members, hundreds of, members of the Republic, Republic of New Republic Africa, Africa were arrested. arrested. Judge Crockett went to the lockup, held court right there, and issued a personal recognizance bond for these people. This is significant because back in those days, it was not unusual for a person to be arrested and spend time in a lockup three years before their case would go to trial. People would lose their entire life savings. And, and, and have and their have life, their destroyed, life destroyed, destroyed, just waiting, just waiting for, trial. for trial. I'm getting an, getting echo, an echo here. here. Got, an, Got echo. an echo. Anyway, people anyway, would have their lives have destroyed, destroyed, waiting, waiting for, trial. for trial. Oftentimes, not even going to trial and being released. And so it was significant that Judge Crockett released those people on a personal bond in order that they could go forward with their lives. This morning, you are in for a tremendous program. We've got two very, very outstanding presenters for you. Steve Tomkowiak is the Executive Director of the Fair Housing Center of Metropolitan Detroit. And Ruth Johnson is the Public Policy Director for the Community Development Advocates of Detroit. So I'm gonna ha tell you a little bit about Steve Komkowiak, even though his bio is in, the, in your materials that you've received today. As I indicated, he is the executive director, basically runs the show. I can testify from personal experience that they do a great job in advocating for fair housing. And without further ado, I'm gonna ask Steve just to come on up. Talk to us about what you do. Thank you so much, Chewy. Left out the fact that he's, for a great number of years, has been a great cooperating attorney. Um, when we have cases that um, have suitable evidence of going to court, we have cooperating attorneys that take cases on a contingency basis. And, uh, Chewy has had remarkable results over the years. So he knows fair housing very, very well, as well as other areas of law. So we're going to um, do a couple things. We'll do a quick overview of our organization and that. I don't know if there's a clicker available at the table. Oh, right in front of me, of course. Sorry. Um, and then get an overview of fair housing. And then we have a fair housing quiz. We're just going to go through it real quick um, and talk about it, just so that when situations arise, people will recognize that there's a fair housing issue. Where do I point this? I'm trying to go real quick. I think it's clicking now, right? Oh, good. Okay, well, this is, shows our mission. We work to ensure equal housing opportunities under all federal, state, local laws, and um, not only anti-discrimination, but to take down barriers, equal housing opportunities. 
Our service area is Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb counties, including the city of Detroit. Actually, the city of Detroit drives 60% of our complaint intake. Um, what, this shows a, a kind of a Michigan map where there's fair housing centers. There's four main fair housing centers. We're in Detroit. We cover Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb County. Um, then there's one in Ypsilanti, Kalamazoo, and Grand Rapids. We also work closely with HUD and the Michigan Department of Civil Rights. For example, we could take a case to HUD or we could take it to the Michigan Department of Civil Rights, have the case go into state or federal court. So a variety of options that we do to address it. Um, there's differences, and I'll get into it in a second, between what HUD, Michigan Department of Civil Rights do and what we do. So here's what happens. HUD has two funding, or Congress has two funding mechanisms, FAP and FIP, Fair Housing Assistance Program that funds HUD and state and local agencies. In Michigan, is unusual for a large state, there's only one agency, the Michigan Department of Civil Rights. HUD and Michigan Department of Civil Rights are neutral. They don't take a side for either party. They investigate, decide whether there's cause or no cause to believe discrimination has occurred. Nationwide statistics show that HUD finds cause about 6% of the time. State and local agencies find cause only about 7% of the time. So it's low. Most of those claims are not successful. If they find cause, it goes to administrative hearing, either in the HUD process or in the Michigan Department of Civil Rights process, it goes to a hearing officer. What happened? I lost it. I didn't touch it, honest. You saw me. Yeah, I'll say that. I need Chewy to defend me on this one. So if it goes to a hearing administrative hearing, right, that's the administrative process. There's no punitive damages, but all the other items of relief can be recovered. If in the federal system, any party, the complainant, the respondent, or even HUD itself, can make a decision to have the case heard in federal court. They have to make an election within 30 days. In that case, the Department of Justice then will take the case and file it in federal district court. Those are called election cases. So the Department of Justice also handles their own cases if they learn of discrimination occurring or they do an investigation, but they have to show a pattern and practice of discrimination. It has to be more systemic in nature. And there's different statute of limitations period for for the um, Department of Justice, it can be very, very um, lengthy period. It really runs three days from when they first learn of the discrimination. That's Department of Justice. We have a different role. We have our separate funding is under FIP, Fair Housing Initiatives Program. We are not, strictly speaking, supposed to be neutral. We're supposed to be advocacy organizations. So our main focus is to assist individuals who believe they've been discriminated against on housing. And so we advocate for them to address what has occurred or we can assist them with the enforcement process. A couple of different things that occur is first off, it's a mistake to think that's all we do. For example, we work closely with landlords, housing providers, probably half our board is from the housing industry. So we're not wild and crazy and out in left field on these things because um, some people paint us in that corner and it's really not accurate. We do, one year I did 59 trainings, last year I did 53 trainings. Majority of those are for housing providers, management companies and so forth. And so those all get done. Um, so we, anybody who contacts our office for information or fair housing questions, we answer it. And it's not unusual to get questions from landlords. Do I have to do this? And what about that? And you know, um, the tenant has a cat as an emotional support animal. We're just a small place. My husband does all the maintenance, and he's very allergic to cats. What can we do? Can we have the cat get removed or, or not? What do we do about that? That kind of a thing. So we're happy to assist anybody who has any kind of fair housing questions. Another important that we're also not like they are jurisdictionally limited to those few statutes. So we have probably half our additional complaints are just housing related complaints, we call them, or housing related inquiries that can involve disputes as security deposits, habitability, um, any kind of landlord tenant work. As resources permit, we assist with um, eviction defense, draft up paperwork, work with um, 
legal service organizations, hopefully when they see a fair housing issue in those cases, they refer those to ours. A lot of our cases come out of an eviction context. Another thing we do is we do fair housing testing. We've purchased FBI grade recording devices and the testers are trained to do those recordings. They can record telephone conversations and on-site visit the evidence that we have and there's a strict train of, chain of custody protocol. There's a um, system in place where recordings cannot be edited or changed. The tester can't even play it back. There's no option to do it. So all of those things to make sure that testing evidence will be admissible in court. HUD, Mission Department of Civil Rights don't do that. They don't advise somebody. Um, for example, if someone is going through, say we're going through the administrative process, well, we, can, we have the option to be their representative. I did a case yesterday, or it was Thursday, um, came up, and then uh, as, as, a, as a representative. The other thing we can do under the law, we can be a plaintiff in a case. Sometimes there aren't really people complaining about certain fair housing issues, so we can step in, be a plaintiff, and advocate. Um, for people. And the last one is private individuals broadly defined can include corporations, agencies, anybody can actually have standing to bring a fair housing claim. So here's the, the regulation that we operate under. You can see um, it's a, what it call a FIP regulation, 24 CFR 125.103. Any organization engaged in fair housing enforcement actions that I can, can't read it too well, right? I'm gonna get, um, private nonprofit tax exam in invading complaint intake, complaint investigation, testing for fair housing investigations and enforcement. So that's what we're supposed to be doing. So why did you go into court? Why didn't you just talk and resolve it? Depends on what the violation is. Sometimes we do just resolve it. Sometimes it needs to go to court and they need to be held accountable to really get meaningful affirmative action and relief to stop the discriminatory housing practice. But we're required to do it. We report what we do and what the results are. That's all standard. I'm doing a grant application right now and HUD wants to know, what are you doing? What kind of results are you getting in cases? So that's, we're just doing our job when we do it. And again, I mentioned how, how the cases can, can go into um, <clears throat> the different forms. There's local fair housing centers and HUD FIP funding. Then there's the FAP proceedings, which, which are agencies, HUD and the Mission Department of Civil Rights, and there's court actions. The one thing about court actions, you can get punitive damages, you can't get that in administrative proceedings. Amazingly, sometimes defendants in administrative proceedings with HUD make the election to have the case heard in court. Like, why would they risk themselves facing punitive damages? Because they just don't know. So that can happen as well. So here's the complaint option. You have um, one year to file with HUD, 180 days to get the complaint to get filed with the Mission Department of Civil Rights. If it's within the 180 days, if it goes to HUD or the Mission Department of Civil Rights, they'll dual file it with HUD to get HUD funding. Even though in all intents and purposes, the complaint will stay with the Mission Department of Civil Rights all the way through the process. Between 180 days and one year, it will be solely with HUD. After one year, HUD won't have any jurisdiction. In that case, the only option for someone is to go straight into court. There's a two-year limitation under the Fair Housing Act. It's three-year limitation period under Michigan law. Um, the Fair Housing Act has tolling, meaning if a complaint, if the Michigan Department of Civil Rights, oh, what's it doing that for? If the Michigan Department of Civil Rights takes a complaint, you gotta see if they get a HUD number on the complaint. If it does, the whole time period that it's pending as an administrative complaint, the two-year limitation period is told. So it doesn't count against the running of the two-year period, and that's really important. And that's, that's the um, standard there. I'm not going to go through it, but for Department of Justice claims. We also, by the way, we do make referrals to the Department of Justice. Plead with them to take cases at time. We're advocates, right? Here's our evidence, here's what we have. I mean, I can, um, Susan DeClerc is now federal judge, Eastern District of Michigan. Right? Long letters to her trying, trying to take one of our cases, which she didn't. It got resolved for multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars, right, for uh, uh, a, what do you call it, um, an entity that provided rehabilitation services in a drug treatment program. And the Department of Justice, I think, should have grabbed the case, but they just, often don't, it's hard to get them to take it, but when they do, they, they can be very, very effective. 
Um, we have relationships with them. We have relationships with people from HUD, Michigan Department of Civil Rights. We got a big meeting with the Michigan Department of Civil Rights on Monday. So we're not like against it. The idea is to get everybody work together to what? Further fair housing. Like, for example, what's going on with the complaints we filed with the Michigan Department of Civil Rights, and why aren't they getting results and things like that? So, you know, they're not always pleasant conversations, but they're important conversations. If we don't stand up for people that have been victims of discrimination, who will? That's all. So it's just doing our jobs. So we give free assistance, do training, outreach, education, research. Just give a real quick summary here. Um, since 1977, over 8,000 complaints of discrimination, over 12 a million dollars has been recovered. I got a log on that. And then we have the first two jury verdicts for uh, lending discrimination. And although we assist thousands of others without the necessity of going into court and doing litigation, in recent decisions, um, we had an urban planning class with Professor Moak from Wayne State University, but these are just recent decisions. We handled a case uh, the, before the Michigan Supreme Court dealing with emotional Court of Appeals in a published decision said you had to have um, ex, uh, certification for disability, like for a reasonable accommodation, a probably reasonable modification, has to satisfy an expert witness requirement, which a person with disability can't hire an expert to get a certification for an assistance animal. I mean, it's just not going to happen. So we got contacted after the Court of Appeals decisions. I did a motion. The board permitted me to represent them. We're not a law firm, but occasionally we can actually represent somebody. So the board permitted, I did a motion for reconsideration with the Court of Appeals. They denied it, of course. Then it went to the Michigan Supreme Court, and they ruled that there is no expert witness requirement for disability certifications. Good news, statewide standard. There's no expert witness requirement under Fair Housing Act, Riot Larson Civil Rights Act. Um, good news. Criminal records policy, that was a recent one, just came out in September. Um, there's a recording where someone says, we can't exercise any discretion. I'm sorry, if you have a criminal record, we can't rent to you. Right? That ends up discriminating against people. Uh, disproportionately impacts who? Black and Hispanic populations because they have a higher incidence of a criminal record. So that's pending in federal court. Chickens as emotional support animals, that was fought by municipalities. And there's actually evidence of therapeutic events, uh, um, evidence that chickens can provide um, emotional support. So there are two favorable decisions on that. We have American Sign Language cases as well, and there's a decision in that. That's just recent. There's more, but you know, I don't go into detail with it. We made a referral just recently on a case because there was a personal injury component, and the attorney got uh, a $500,000 default judgment. So we, again, HUD, Michigan Department of Civil Rights are not going to do that. They're not going to be referring out a personal injury type claim. We do, right? We do anything we can to assist someone. So we have to be very knowledgeable about the laws. Um, that's a picture of the Supreme Court argument last October. Um, so due to grant funding, our services are provided free of charge. Please consider being a member, even if you have an organization, have your members um, be an organization kind of technical, but we need it for purposes of bringing enforcement action. So we're going to be doing real push for membership. We have no choice. We are a membership organization. These are fair housing trainings. That was one in Denver. Back, somebody sent me an email. Are you still executive director? Like, like what? <laughs> I just thought that was kind of roots. So I made copies of these things and sent it to her. So that's why then I just put it on the slide. So anyways, that's going to be next week. And I was out in Denver for a HUD conference. I think I'm still there. The board hadn't told me I'm not. When they do, I'm, I'm done. Um, there's an article in the Michigan Bar Journal about disparate impact. So we do research. Here's another one. We sometimes collaborate with, Michi with um, University of Michigan on research and that. That's all part of our mission. We're supposed to do that. Here's another one with COVID and the racial impact of it. And we have a bike-a-thon. That's our second annual bike-a-thon. We participate arts, beats, and eats. So we're doing a lot to get the word out on fair housing. There's advertisements, bus advertisements. So it's a lot. And then there's advocacy. Which is an ad this one has to do with the pending legislation, House Bill, Michigan House Bill 4878, dealing with criminal record requirements. That's a great bill. Hopefully that gets passed. And then here's the one dealing with... Um, um, source, I think this one's source of income. 
And there's a problem with that. I have it on here. I did a, um, Detroit Future City did a summary of um, the landscape or landlord characteristics. The Michigan Senate bills that they passed just last week on source of income exempts out landlords with four or fewer rental properties. And so the percentage of that is roughly, because of that exemption, it's so broad, using Detroit Future City approach to see what the characteristics of the landlords. For the rental units, 67% would not be subject to source of income protection because of that four or fewer exemption. There should be no exemption. We got a blog on our website. There should be no exemption, period. If source of income gets passed, it should cover all properties, period. That's how the law should be. That's all. It doesn't. It will be so completely unworkable. For example, let's say a housing provider has six properties. Well, what if they form separate LLCs? Then what? So you got to go around, dig around, find out that they're connected and, and show it's the same person. So imagine the complexity of all of that. Another thing. So again, we're all, I'm talking about the 32%. So it's going to be difficult to see even the coverage for the 32% of those properties. Sometimes it's not going to be apparent that they're really covered. Um, What's the nice thing to do? And sometimes the market rate, the, the rental rate is too high. It's above the market rate. So of that 32%, you have multiple entities, and then you have some rental rates above um, the HUD established market rate. So what are we looking at from the 32%? What's it going to end up with? 20%, 10%? Right? Why do we need to comp The law is complex enough. The exemptions got put into the Fair Housing Act because... Congress was concerned as to whether the Fair Housing Act could reach purely private housing transactions. They weren't sure that it could be constitutional. There was a case, Jones versus Alfred Mayer, was pending before the Supreme Court. So Congress, after King's assassination and funeral, passed the Fair Housing Act with the exceptions, with those exemptions, like shingle family net, someone... Um, <clears throat> Uh, three or fewer homes, they're not going, generally not going to be covered. 1968, in June 1968, the Supreme Court issued its decision, which held that Section 1982, another civil rights statute, reaches purely private housing transactions and that is constitutional. 42 United States Code 1982 covers housing discrimination, has no exemptions at all. So it covers every single property. Had Jones come out earlier, we wouldn't have it. What's my point? The exemption been carried forward by HUD and their regulations when it comes to state and local agencies. And Mission uh, Elliot Larson and Chewy is correct, right? He's absolutely correct. The housing industry does not want source of income. Every time fair housing has moved forward legislatively, it's been the real estate industry, apartment associations, all of these groups will talk fair housing, but they don't support it. It's just lip service. I, I could go around source of income throughout the country. I think it's up to 23 states that already have it. Many of them don't have any exemption like that. All right, we go to the next one real quick. I want to respect the time and Ruth's time too, so. I can almost jump to this one. Is, can, you, can you put up the other PowerPoint real quick? Or let me do this. This will work. I've got a uh, fair housing quiz. Do you see that? In your packet, there's extras as well. Yeah, and you've got the cheat sheet too. We'll see why the cheat sheet's important. Our right, first one is, this is the quiz. Please identify which categories are fully or partially unlawful under federal or state fair housing laws. First one is pets. Any fair housing issue with pets? There is? There's animals, ADA, or Fair Housing Act, which is it? Let's back up for a second. 
Can a landlord have a no pet policy? Yes or no? Yes. No pet policies are permitted. Must a landlord make an exception for a assistance animal defined as a emotional support animal or service animal? Yes. Under the Fair Housing Act or ADA? Fair housing. When does the ADA apply? The ADA has 12 categories. And that only applies, ADA only applies if it's a place of public accommodation. So let's say there's a community center at the apartment complex or a community center in the um, condominium association or co-op. If that community center is available to tenants or residents and their guests, would it be subject to the ADA? Yes. Because the tenants and their guests. No, that's fair housing. If it's open to the public at large, then the ADA covers it. In fact, then you'd have the Fair Housing Act and the ADA covering it. How about the parking lot? Who uses the parking lot? Tenants and their guests? Fair housing. If it's open to the public? ADA. Let's say there's a rental office. Who can go into the rental office? The public to do what? To try to rent, make an application. That's a place of public accommodation. It's subject to the ADA. It's also subject to the fair housing. They're talking about renting rest of public accommodation. That's the distinction. People take the ADA hammer and they hit every property with it when it's really most often it's just fair housing. Okay? So let's go back to the question here. Go to the cheat sheet. We got a question about emotional support animals. Where do you look? On the cheat sheet, it's got emotional support animals. There's only two sources you need to look at. HUD has a 2020 guidance assessing a person's request to have an animal as a reasonable accommodation under the Fair Housing Act, period. That's all you need to look at. You'll have the answers. It's about 20 pages. It's very detailed. Enormously helpful. Suppose you've got an ADA question. Well, the next one, DOJ frequently asks questions about service animals and the ADA. Many of the questions we have with fair housing have been answered. People just don't know where to get the answers to. And that's what we do. If we bring claims, we say, well, look, at this has been, you know, this has been the standard for 30 years, and they're still not following it. They don't care about the law, Your Honor. Right? Often, uh, courts will follow this policy, these policy statements. Number two, age. Can age be a violation? Is there a fair housing issue with age discrimination? Certainly. Under what law? There is no federal age law when it comes to housing, but we do have age protection under Michigan Elliott Larson. So, yes, that can be discrimination based on age. We had a place where... Um, how's if I had a brochure, it was 55 and over housing, they whited out the 55 and put 35. And it's recommended all around the country that they do that. The problem is it is permissible in most places except in states that have age discrimination. So that's a violation. So what was their answer? Um, that was just on one brochure. That was one employee, and, we, and there's one employee. It turned out there were two that were doing it. And we let them both go. But that wasn't true either. They were both still working there. So not a very good case. <laughs> not a very good case and not a very good defense. They actually called us up to do training. I said, what, do you, what property are you talking about? Well, and that was the one that we, well, we're the plaintiff. We're a plaintiff in that case. We can't do training for you. We can't even talk to you. All right, how about sex? Sex and protected class? Yes, 1974 under federal and state law. And Mission, um, Ellie Larson just got amended to include sexual orientation and gender identity or expression. So that's been added expressly. The Fair Housing Act does not have, or no federal law has sexual orientation, gender identity. However, it is um, interpreted to cover sexual orientation and gender identity and expression. So assume it's there. Race. Yeah, of course. Um, housekeeping practices. Little story about that. There's a beloved city to the south, down river. I'm not going to name it to protect. What they would do is it was senior housing, 
before they would allow someone to become a tenant, they would send somebody there to go to the property and look at the housekeeping practices and write a report. If your housekeeping practices were good, you could come in. If they were not what the standard that they wanted, you could not come in. See a problem with that. What's the problem? Subjective. And what about someone with a disability? Someone in a wheelchair. Where will the items be within their unit? A well, hand rain, it's not going to have the same neatness, cleanliness of someone who's not a wheelchair user. It's not fair to exp do that. Um, or someone who's blind, right? Various persons, right, they're going to have more difficulty. So you see the issue with that. That's a concern. So the recommendation is what? Should you judge somebody? Again, we're not talking about, and there's a, you know, a habitability checklist. If it's a health and safety issue, certainly you can stop someone from being a tenant or, or you know, when they're in, move for eviction. For example, if hoarding goes to the point where it then becomes to, what, infect health and safety, fire hazard, things of that nature, certainly that can be addressed. No, that raises fair housing issues. Very subjective. What else do they learn when they go visit another See where that person is. What do they? What do they really find out about the person? I'll give you an yeah. Uh, just recently, where they said provide um, state your race and provide a photo of yourself. That is per se unlawful. It's a violation right there. It's never permissible to ask somebody about their protected class status. It's only two narrow limitations for disability. If the property is set aside for people with a disability or a certain type of disability, you can ask, but only if you've set aside properties for persons with a disability or a certain type of dis disability. Otherwise, you can't ask about race, color, national origin, religion. It's not relevant. It's per se unlawful. How do you feel if someone says, oh, by the way, give me your race? Feel good? Feel comfortable? Of course not. What are they doing with the information? Why are they going an on-site visit? Right, so that's how, so I'm just raising it so you think fair housing and you'll be able to spot these issues. How about gender identity? Same thing. We had one where um, transgender female in Detroit, rental property, people were throwing all kinds of garbage on the front lawn. So the tenant put up a camera to see who was doing it. Well, what happened is um, the maintenance person from the management company came on the porch at, to meet with the DTE service technician and started talking. Well, you know, it's a he, she recorded, right? Not smart. The camera wasn't put up there to catch it. What does someone's gender identity have to do with maintenance? It shouldn't have anything to do with it. Amount of income. Can you discriminate against someone because of the amount of their income? Yes. Is that unlawful? No. We were talking about source of income, but amount of income, that's legitimate. How about smokers? Are smokers a protected class? No. No. In fact, HUD encourages no smoking policies on multifamily multi-family business offices, not the multi-family business, but multi-unit like um, business properties as well for health and safety reasons. Yeah. On that, I'm wondering, uh, it hasn't. Yep. And uh, HUD regulations define alcoholism as a covered disability in the regulations. And